The data is in. PPI is on the rise and that means inflation is on the rise. But the markets clearly did not care and continued what has been the resilient rally. So what does this mean for CPI and especially the economy? Today we'll be talking about that and specifically the economy, fiscal spending, taxation and the all important deficit. We're expecting $900 billion in interest income alone in 2024. It was $698 billion last year. Just how sustainable is this that's the question we're going to answer today. We'll also be diving into earnings. Things are wrapping up for the S&P 500. Where exactly do we stand with S&P 500 Q1 earnings? We've got a lot to talk about. But let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. Guys, if you'd like this video, please subscribe. We're trying to get 10,000 subscribers in May. Also leave a like on this video. Hit the notification bell. Let's get into it. So another green day here. This marks the seventh green day in a row for the nasdaq 100 i believe something very very similar here for the s p 500 and it was led by technology and semiconductors we have semis right here nvidia up a percent and you know a lot of other companies here who reported pretty good earnings uh on the up and up we also saw financials actually rally quite a bit maybe not so much berkshire visa or mastercard but every other stock in the sector did really really well including regional banks for the most part but other than like Tesla, we saw very, very mixed action across the board. I mean, just look at industrials. There were green members. There were red members. Such goes the market. What we are starting to see is defensives fading ahead of this rally. So we started to see utilities. They put out a negative day. Same two year with consumer defensives. And then healthcare is normally half and half. The healthcare sector is normally divided between drug manufacturers, healthcare plans. You know, these two uh, really have their own way of trading. They can diverge from each other. But all in all, guys, it was a very, very mixed day across the board, but it was green nonetheless because we had the big sectors at the top. Look at semiconductors and then technology, right? And then we did have these sectors that outperform technology, but they don't have the same weight that tech does, especially when it does put up a 0.89% day, which is a pretty big day nonetheless. We had XME, KRE, GDX. Now, these are commodity driven and or rate sensitive sectors. Now, commodities did gain on the PPI news, and as a result, rates came down. That's why we saw a bit of upbeat action in these sectors right here, along with, you know, XLRE, so real estate, home builders, and then we had software and financials up here. But if you actually look at it, they all outperform the SPY. And that's really the proxy you want to use when you're doing your sector analysis. Did it outperform the SPY? Did it underperform the SPY? Now, those that underperformed the SPY was XLY, XLC, XLF, XLU. Same here with energy, materials, industrials was the first negative sector, and then staples was another negative sector right here. So a very, very upbeat day across the board. Some indices are making all-time highs, others aren't. And the reason why we rallied today actually had to do with PPI or revisions specifically. See, we got hot April data. PPI came in at 0 0.5 versus 0 0.3. And yes, the initial reaction was pretty bad, but we parred a lot of those losses simply because um, March was revised from plus 0.3, which was the hot number, remember, to negative 0 0.1. And that is why the market just looked past this PPI print. Everything's going to come down to the CPI print. And we want to see what revisions are going to happen for the CPI print. Is our revisions going to get revised down this significantly as we saw in the PPI? Now, another thing that uh, helped us close at all time highs, at least in the NASDAQ, was that semis are rallying. You know, TSM released data on Friday that their March saw 60% year-over-year -year sales increase quite significant and you know when semis rally tech rallies and when tech and semis are rallying the whole market really gets a lift because they are the heaviest weighted sectors in the market but let's quickly jump on the charts all right so here is the s p 500 guys you can see we are less than half a percent or even 0.1 or 0.2 percent away from new all-time highs we probably will go hit that and we probably are going to travel to the 5300 area particularly where the call gamma resistance has moved up the tape we can also see the very similar thing here with the nasdaq 100 even less so in fact apart from this close right here it actually is less than 0.1 of a percentage point away from closing at all time highs we can see a very similar situation here with the dow jones as well as the rsp and a lot of these stocks look at the rsp a little bit upbeat here in the after hours up 0.3 but you know the s p 500 the nasdaq or the dow jones they weren't the winners of today in fact Look at the IWM up another percentage point. And, you know, we talk about this in breadth in the video. You know, the mid caps and small caps are actually outperforming uh, these larger cap names. And it just goes to show the broadening nature of the market as well as financial conditions getting a bit easier. We did.
did actually see rates pull back today and we have and this just tells us that you know these smaller names are completely dependent on what's happening with rates rate cuts and where yields are at the current moment we also saw value underperform growth for the most part and again you know the s p 500 the nasdaq and the russell are a bit upbeat here in the after hours now as I said before, yields did fall. Now, this is the after hours prices. So yields looking a little bit upbeat in the after hours. But in aggregate, you have to understand that uh, AGG, TLT, HY and LQD were upbeat. So if bonds go up, guys, that means yields had to come down because bonds and stocks have an inverse relationship relative to the duration on the bond. Then we actually saw Bitcoin move lower. Let's actually pull up the chart here on Bitcoin. Yeah, it does look like this trend line it might not be an exact science, but it does look like this trend line is providing some form of a resistance here at this area. It probably means Bitcoin is probably going to move lower in that regard. We saw gold move have a very, very big move today here up 1%. I'm assuming it's very much the same with silver. This is the after hours price. This green candle is what you really want to look at right here. And then we have the DXY pulling back. So we had a little bit of a relief rally here and now we're actually pulling back. That is a lower high here for the DXY. That's exactly what you want to see. Now looking at the S&P 500, very, very interesting stuff. So we can see, okay, a green body candle was pretty much at the top of the day. Very interesting, very bullish near all-time highs we're probably going to get to that 5300 mark go look at the jex chart a little bit later on in the video i explain exactly why that's going to happen but before we move into the overall analysis let's actually have a look at what happened on the five minute chart so we opened right here on monday okay so we opened this is where we opened and then we did a bit of sideways training you know we went up we went down uh buying dips selling rips and then we came all the way down and we sort of formed this like double top and you know you could say this if we break this neckline we're probably going to go lower but we did trap a ton of shorts in this area and this is probably why we rallied up we had a bit of a squeeze and then with the squeeze came the algos there's really dte traders and everybody else trying to get on board uh you know the intraday rally because we're not going to go lower and then we made our way all the way to the top and then we had a bit of zero dte action right here we tend to see this type of price action these type of candles on pretty big volume in this opex week it's just what happens with the market when there's a ton of volume that needs to be rolled off the tape. But when you're all time highs, there's not much to say. You know, I've been saying all week that the line in the sand you want to look at is the 5165 area. This is the area right here. This is the gamma flip zone. And any pullbacks we do get to this area, you do want to be buyers of dips for new all time highs. However, you really should already be positioned from here, if not significantly lower in the S&P 500. But yeah, you know, if we do get a pullback 51.64, look at it as a dip buying opportunity for a move higher to break these all time highs right here. If we do go lower, this does pose a little bit of an issue and we can actually move to as low as the 5000 area. However, I do think we're going to find support right above the 5000 area. That would then still be a higher low and then we could still look to buy this dip right here and look for, again, all time highs or breakage of this high. So guys, you want to be buyers of dips and you want to trim your exposure via selling rips when we get to these very, very key levels. Let's say you got in right here, okay? I would maybe trim trim 10%, you know, maybe take some profits off your position, secure some money, nothing wrong with taking profits. And then if we do get a pullback, you can maybe add some more. If not, you have cash. There's nothing wrong with holding cash for 5% at the moment right now. But until we break 51.64, I don't see any significant downside. And I think the market wants new all-time highs. I think that's exactly what the market wants. And we're going to go ahead and get new all-time highs here in the S&P 500. Now, guys, it's time for a temperature check. This is two sentiment indicators we look at every single week. Both as bull bear indicator as well as Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator. Very reliable short to medium term indicators. And what we can see right here is that according to the Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator positioning is stretched anything above one is considered stretched we are currently at 1.1 having rebounded nearly off the zero line in the last couple of weeks after we had that garden variety pullback in the S&P 500 so we pulled back from very stretched positioning into the zero line which proved a good dip buying opportunity and now we are back above stretched positioning both as bull bear indicator is firmly sitting here at the five Point four level so closer to the sell side than it is to the buy side however not in stretched positioning per se like the goldman sachs sentiment indicator and these two indicators combined are telling us a very very similar story essentially it's telling us that you want to be holding equities the perfect time to buy was when this indicator was very close to a five as well as the goldman sachs sentiment indicator
later right here near the zero line that was the perfect time to buy i did advise buying at that point and that proved to be great buying opportunity so now if you are in equities you want to hold equities to some degree you might actually want to start trimming at these levels however i do suggest maintaining a decent exposure because according to the bofa bull bear indicator we do actually have a lot of room to run to the sell side as well as the sentiment indicator sentiment can get much more stretched to the upside right here now looking at some seasonal stats that actually supports the case for higher price momentum this is the nasdaq composite performance from may 11th to 31st when april 30th to may 11th is up at least two percent we've actually done this recently april 30th to may 11th returned 3.18 percent return and that means we can expect favorable bullish outcomes over the next 12 to 15 trading days on average in this period with this return we normally do see a 2.82 percent return in the subsequent time period 13 wins zero losses very very bullish stats and these stats coupled with the sentiment indicators are telling us that you want to be exposed to some form of equities because risk is to the upside let's talk earnings we had some pretty notable names today we had sony home depot c right here also nu bank a pretty big bank there in south america we also had alibaba group and this is the one we're going to look at today simply because this right here this company is the amazon of china of the hsi market they have a very similar business model we're going to dive in and see how they did now alibaba had very mixed earnings they actually missed here on the eps front but they did beat on sales they missed by two cents ever so slightly now because it did miss earnings on a forward pe basis the stock did get ever so slightly more expensive but they did actually declare a 66 cent special dividend as well as their normal one dollar per share annual dividend so that's a dollar 66 for the annual dividend here for alibaba the stock was actually down about two percent in the pre-market this segment was recorded pre-market and for everything that i could see there wasn't anything overly bad or overly good about the stock i think if we do miss eps everything will be short-lived with the stock that trades on an 8x pe like alibaba it's deeply undervalued and even though it did get a little bit more expensive on an absolute basis it is still largely undervalued comparatively speaking to its peers and across similar businesses if you look at businesses like Amazon and, and other businesses that operate uh, in the same industry with the same breadth that it has. So, you know, not bad earnings, not great earnings. But considering where the Chinese economy is to still do $30 billion here of revenue, still pull out, you know, numbers like these, I would say it's pretty good, all things considered. Now, diving into earnings for the broader market, this is Goldman Sachs portfolio strategy and their expectations versus the overall market's consensus expectations right here. Very, very interesting stats. So before we get into this, right, do understand that $225 is the current 2023 earnings per share figure for the S&P 500. Goldman Sachs expects by the end of 2024, $241 in earnings per share. That's an 8% growth over this figure right here and then in 2012 they expect 256 that's six percent growth for 2025 and that would essentially leave us right now at a 21.2 times forward 24 pe and a 20.4 times forward 2025 pe now the consensus expectations are far more bullish not so much in 2024 but definitely here in 2025 expecting double what goldman sachs is predicting at 13 percent growth on 277 dollars worth of eps that would leave us at an 18 18.8 times PE and looking at this valuation with this figures looks very very reasonable at 18.8 times the consensus 2024 expectations is 244 per share 9 percent growth 20.6 times forward PE very reasonable so it seems like the market is kind of agreeing where 2024 is going to end up still a lot of tossing and turning here with the 2025 numbers I would take Goldman Sachs figures with a grain of salt they tend to be quite conservative sort of the under promise and over deliver type of scenario imagine someone said you're getting six percent growth and you actually get seven eight nine percent you're not going to complain versus if someone said you're going to get 13 percent and then in the months leading up to this figure they started it revising it to the downside what do i think is the true number i think somewhere in the middle eight nine maybe ten percent might be the right number but where does that leave us with overall valuation excluding a pe now we do know that the s p 500 currently trades at 20 times they're about a point or two higher tomatoes tomatoes but when we look at other valuation metrics the s p 500 is fairly expensive 
on all those other metrics. Look at a free cash flow yield of 3.3%, 3.1 times EV to sales, and a PEG ratio of 1.3. That is a little pricey if you do ask me. But then we do look at the most expensive sector, and a lot of this is weighted towards info technology. Now, it is trading at a 27.2 times, and this sector does make up 30% of the S&P 500, and that does include semiconductors. So it is fairly pricey, and it does contribute a lot to this right here. On an equal weight basis, S&P 500 is actually trading at 17 times, but diving into the other sectors individually, energy, financials, and real estate are actually the cheapest sectors on a PE basis, but not so much on a PEG basis. In fact, on a PEG basis, excluding like industrials, materials, and consumer staples, these are some of the most expensive sectors on a growth performance metric basis. And some of them don't even have free cash flow yield because it's kind of hard to calculate. However, energy does have a 6.4% free cash flow yield, and they do return quite a lot of money to shareholders. Essentially, you are buying quite a lot of shareholder value at what is a very reasonable PE, but there's not much growth. In fact, you could probably say that growth is decelerating in that regard for the energy sector. So you're going to have to pick out your battles accordingly, depending on where you get into. Looking at the best price to earnings growth ratio here, you actually get the com services sector followed by the healthcare sector, and they trade on fairly easy free cash flow yields, 5.1%, 3.5% respectively, and reasonable PEs, both of them trading under the S&P 500 market multiple. And from healthcare all the way down to infotech, we have consumer discretionary, industrials, materials, and consumer staples. They are very, very pricey compared to their growth and the free cash flow yield. Essentially, I would only say you really want to be buying into probably info technology based on, well, the growth expectations you can get out of this sector, as well as maybe healthcare, com services, potentially energy, and if you're not already in financials, financials as well. Other than that, it looks like the other sectors are either not growing or just simply too pricey for my like. Now, moving away from valuation and back to earnings, this right here is just some data from Bloomberg. S&P 500 companies continue to outpace expectations. And guys, earnings are coming in very, very good. Current consensus earnings are well over 10%, excluding the BMY adjustment. Very, very good earnings. At the start of earnings season, we were looking at about 3.5% right there. And in aggregate, we're trading at about 7.8% in earnings for the S&P 500, doing really, really well. And this actually has to do with the earnings surprise beat rate sitting at about 8%. The consensus is normally just about 3 or 4% right here. So we're beating earnings by quite a large margin. However, the sales beat rate is coming about in line. We're not really beating sales to the upside, only just a slight beat. So earnings is coming in very, very good, guys. And that is part of the reason why we're seeing the price action behind the S&P 500, at least in the last week week and a half, you know, at bottoming out and now rallying to pretty close to new all time highs. Now let's talk a bit about the economy and specifically about the deficit and how that's going to be funded. Now in 2023, we had a deficit of 7.4% here of GDP, about $2 billion in a cash deficit. That is quite a large deficit. In 2021, it was 12.1% GDP. In 2020, 14.7% of GDP. So since the COVID situation, deficit spend Spending has ramped up quite significantly and has stayed quite elevated. And that's part of the reason why equity markets have done really, really well, why the job market and everything as such has been quite resilient because the amount of money being pumped into the system, guys, essentially this is just liquidity being pumped into the system is very, very large. And in 2024, if we look at the consensus expectations right here, Goldman Sachs, SIBO, OMB, we're looking at about maybe anywhere from five, 5.5 to 6% of GDP as a deficit this year. And this is going to be very close to $1.7 trillion in a deficit here for the United States. Now, looking at tax receipts, tax receipts are coming in very, very strong, very close to what they did here in 2022. And in some estimates, we might even have the highest tax receipts ever, very close to $5 trillion. Now, even though you are getting quite a lot of tax receipts here in the US, the deficit is still about $2 trillion, which means you're spending about $7 trillion versus $5,000 in collected tax receipts seats or just general income as a whole. Looking at primary spending, so this is essentially just expenditure before interest and other debt charges. Essentially, what is the cost to run the government excluding interest and tax? So if this for the government would be equivalent to what a company, what we call EBITDA, okay, or EBIT, whatever you want to call it. This is what this number tells us. We can see right here that in 2020, this gray line, it was at about 6 trillion, just over 6 trillion. We could see that in 2023, we were looking at about 5.2, 5.3, 
$3.3 trillion in primary spending. And here in 2024, we're already at 3.195. And the expectation is quite wide. We're looking at anywhere from 5.5 to $7.5 trillion. So analysts can't really decide what primary spending for the US government is going to look like. However, it is pretty high. And this doesn't even include interest expense, which is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy when you think about that. And then looking at interest expense, the expectation right now is going to be very, very close to $900 billion. In fact, at the top end, we're probably looking at $900 billion worth of interest expense. Currently, we've paid $514 billion here in April 2023. We paid just a year ago. My goodness, we paid about 700, just under $700 billion in interest expense. So a huge ramp up in interest expense, particularly over the last couple of years. And this has to do with with rising interest rate costs and just the amount of debt that's being serviced by T-bills and notes instead of longer term bonds. And this is what you tend to get. Not sustainable in the long term. You can see we're expecting a huge whole year. And if interest rates stay where they are and the government keeps spending the way they are, do expect this number to be a lot higher in 2000 and 25 not sustainable in my personal opinion now this right here is the fiscal effects by election scenario so we got a republican sweep if a 10 percent tariff and new tax cuts were to come into fruition you can actually see that the deficit is going to continue to grow this red line right here if we get an, a republican sweep with targeted tariffs and no new tax cuts nothing changes much so this is what a republican sweep is going to look like the deficit will grow ever so slightly. A Democrat sweep will actually see a slight shrinking of the deficit. Very, very interesting. And then a Biden divided government, a further shrinking of the deficit. Then we got a Trump divided government, very similar to what's going to happen with a Biden divided divided government in terms of the deficit shrinking and then a Trump divided gov government with 10% tariffs will see a huge shrinkage of the deficit. I wonder if this is going to come to pass. We'll see very, very interesting uh, stats right there. Your Whatever your political party is, you can see what would happen if you do vote, at least according to estimates here from 2025 to 2029. Now, guys, looking at the JEX chart, some very big changes have occurred, and it mostly has to do with the core resistance here at 5,300. It was at 5,200 the entire time, and we actually saw a big move to the upside here to the 5,300 strike. That is insanely bullish, especially leading up into OPEX. We could also see that the 5,250 is ever so slightly bigger than the 5200 and this pretty much tells us that leading up into opex on friday options traders have pretty much rolled up all of their positive gamma which is bullish these strikes the call gamma resistance as well as the 5000 level when above the indicative gamma flip zone act as magnets market makers want to take price to these massive strikes as to hedge their books because market makers want their books hedged to neutrality they don't want any risk on their books and they can only hedge when they get to these strikes so do expect dips to be bought rips to be sold all the way to 5300 we are above the gamma flip at 1 5165 i wouldn't consider any significant downside action until we get below this line right here the gamma strike has moved up it is very very bullish we can actually see a ton of downside support as well particularly here at the 5200 5250 level guys this is awfully bullish at the same time the 5500 and the 5400 strike are getting built out as well the 5300 the 5350 as well and this is very very bullish leading up into this opex we're gonna have to see what happens when all of this does get rolled off after this weekend but i do see further upside even post opex sure the window of weakness might cause a little bit of a, a sell side to be expected but momentum is 100 on the size of the bulls on the technical aspect the fundamental aspect and now even the options market so very very bullish activity right here and it probably means we go higher it probably means we see 5300 before the end of may into new all-time highs i know it seems crazy but this is what the data tells us and when this was at four, when the call gamma strike was at 4800 and the gamma flip was like at 4700 in december it seemed crazy to get to 4800 look at where we are right now so buy dips sell rips all the way to 5300 that is your new line of support now guys looking at market breadth we've seen a stark difference here in overall market breadth have a look at you know stocks at one month highs three month highs six month highs in the s p 500 just 10 days ago only eight percent of stocks 5.8 5.2 and 3.6 percent of stocks were at 12 percent highs look at it right now a huge change 11 percent 15 17 26 percent uh percentage of stocks at one month highs we actually see even more strength here in s p 500 mid -cap 
caps and you can definitely just see just look at the colors you see a lot of green right here that's what you want to see very like light white light green white right here at the same time stocks making new lows is moving this way that's what you want to see in stocks making new lows it's virtually not there at all 12 month lows all the way to one month lows and this is seen even here in mid caps this is seen even here at small caps in fact small caps and mid caps at monthly highs are showing much more strength than larger cap stocks however we do have a lot of small cap stocks that are showing uh, a bit more weakness in the one month lows three month lows six month lows relatively speaking to large caps so great breadth across the board the options data is in the side of the bulls the fundamental picture in terms of earnings is in the side of the bulls and you don't want to be short this market earnings is growing margins are expanding traders are rolling up the strikes we're going to see 5300 very very soon you don't want to be short this market guys you want exposure you want to be long equities risk is skewed to the upside data in the upcoming week so the big one is going to be retail sales here on the 15th then we have cpi on the 15th as well and on the 16th we have initial jobless claims producer prices housing starts industrial production and building permits so we know what happened with ppi today so it's onward and upward for the rest of the week if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell guys like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers